In June of 2020, Sony revealed the PlayStation 5 alongside a slate of games that would build hype and define the launch of the brand new console. Games like Spider-Man Miles Morales, Astro's Playroom, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, and Grand Theft Auto V for some reason. One of those games was Returnal, a third-person action shooter from Housemark, the developers of Resogun and Nex Machina. At its release this last spring, Returnal made waves as one of PlayStation 5's first big exclusives of the generation. And the reason why that's special is simple. Returnal is a full-priced roguelite that's leading the charge for a new generation. So it's time to ask some questions. One, what the f is a roguelite? Two, why are they so fun? And three, are we about to see this genre become bigger than ever? Welcome to The Blessing Show, where I break down what's up. So let's talk about what's up with roguelites. Roguelite, roguelike, rogue game, the rogue one Gary Witta. We hear these rogue terms thrown around to describe games with permadeath and randomized levels. Games like Hades, Dead Cells, and Returnal. But what the f*** is Rogue? Well, Rogue is a 1980 dungeon crawler developed for Unix mainframes. In Rogue, the player explores a grid-based map using turn-based movements while encountering enemies in order to achieve the main goal of retrieving the Amulet of Yendor. The game was basic, so basic that the graphics were literally just text, which begs the question, how did we get from this to this? Well, Rogue was made with a few things in mind. One, limited hardware. Being developed for Unix mainframes led to the devs creating a game that would be less intensive on memory by not having to create entire game worlds. Two, replayability. Wanting to create a game that could constantly be replayed and enjoyed even by the game developers without getting old. And three, meaningful action. Creating a game where your actions have meaning. With choice comes consequence. Make the wrong decision, choose the wrong item, and it can end your whole game. Rogue, although not the the very first game of its kind was a hit, and not soon after its release, similar games started to come out. Games like NetHack, Moria, and many others. And so the roguelike in its early form was born. Games like Mystery Dungeon, Dwarf Fortress, and many others carried the formula forward. But the more we started to see games iterate upon roguelike systems, the more the question came up. What defines a roguelike? In 2008, a group of devs came together at the International Roguelike Development Conference to create a concrete definition of what a roguelike is. This definition was called the Berlin Interpretation, which sounds way more official and serious than it actually is. The Berlin Interpretation states that there are eight high value factors to being a roguelike. These are the eight must-haves of a roguelike as determined by a group of experts, but this design bible isn't necessarily followed by what you may consider some of your favorite roguelike games. That's where we get into the difference between roguelikes and roguelites. Light being the term applied to games that only loosely follow these guidelines. Games that take core inspirations from roguelike games such as procedural generation and permadeath, but forget other rules like turn-based gameplay. As indie games have risen to prominence over the last decade, we've seen a large swath of roguelites arise as well. Games like Splunky, The Binding of Isaac, FTL, and Don't Starve started to shake up the rogue formula, and now we're coming off of a year where one of the biggest Game of the Year winners was an indie dungeon crawling roguelite inspired by Greek mythology. Enter a rogue generation of indies. When I first got my PS4, one of the early indie games I became obsessed with was Rogue Legacy. Rogue Legacy is a charming 2D action game where you repeatedly explore an ever-shifting castle. Every time you die in the game, you come back as one of your children, taking up the mantle and returning to avenge your loss and complete your run. Each choice of offspring in Rogue Legacy has unique character traits, like being shorter, nearsighted, or even being gay, the kicker being that that last one doesn't affect gameplay at all. Rogue Legacy quickly went from being another pixel art side-scroller to a straight-up addiction, as it was the first roguelite I'd played, and I'd played it without even knowing what a roguelite was. All I knew was that I couldn't put the game down. With each death inside of a castle, I knew I could push further as I'd upgrade my abilities and gear. Understanding enemies and knowing how to approach them along with testing my luck with each optional room was a gameplay loop that captured what I loved about becoming good at action platformers, leveling up in RPGs, and exploring a map in Metroidvanias, all while giving me the rush of knowing that my run could end permanently at any moment. It's a feeling that, as I'm describing it, you might relate to in your own experiences playing roguelites. It's the roguelite magic. For me, it was Rogue Legacy that gave me my first hit of this type of game. For many, it may have been Binding of Isaac, FTL, or one of the most notable roguelites of the last decade and a half. Uh, my name is Derek Yu, and I am 
best known as the creator of Spelunky. I'm a game developer. I sat down with Derek Yu to talk about the creation of Spelunky and how the game spawned a new trend of roguelites during the early era of modern indie games. Spelunky is a roguelike platformer. It's an action roguelike. You know, there are a lot of different names for the type of game that Spelunky is. I think it's best known as being one of the first roguelite games or action roguelikes. And it kind of opened the doors for indie developers to make these types of games. I think it just showed people that you could take all of these cool aspects from traditional turn-based roguelikes and apply them to different genres like platformers, or top-down shooters, or basically anything you can think of. Over time, we've seen takes on the roguelike formula become more varied and diverse. Splunky itself is a 2D action platformer where you explore a colossal cave structure and whip down enemies Indiana Jones style. But then you have Binding of Isaac, a top-down dungeon crawler where you play as a, hold on, let me read these notes, a baby whose mother tries to murder him, and then he has to escape a basement do we just allow anybody to develop video games? One of the most interesting things I learned while talking to Derek is that the conversation around what is a roguelike, what is a roguelite, the Berlin interpretation, and all the above is like points and whose line is it anyway, it doesn't matter. And with games pushing the formula in wildly different directions, it's almost fruitless to talk about roguelites as a genre. If anything, it's a framework. Void Bastards is an entirely different game from Slay the Spire, but the heart of rogue still exists in both. And as a design philosophy with elements that can feed into various types of games, that's where roguelites shine. Derek touched on this talking about how viable roguelite elements are. You know, I think Spelunky showed that these roguelike elements, if you want to call them that, were just very powerful and very flexible. After Spelunky came out, you know, the first two games that were sort of major for the roguelite explosion are The Binding of Isaac and FTL, and they were both really big successes. They were also both completely different games. And so that really just showed like, you can make any type of game you want, essentially, with these roguelike elements. So much has changed and evolved since the days of the first Splunky. We've gotten a generation and a half's worth of indie games, and roguelites have only risen in popularity, variation, and scope. In fact, just earlier this year, we got what is possibly the first AAA roguelite in PlayStation Studios Returnal. So where are we at with roguelites today? On August 21st, 2017, Housemark, developers of Resogun, Next Machina, and a number of similar fast action indie games published a blog post titled Arcade is Dead. In it, they described a crossroads they'd approached as a studio. Housemark had built a reputation over the years, creating critically successful, beloved arcade style games. Yet, despite the awards and the excellent reviews, their games wouldn't sell significant numbers. So, in this blog post, Housemark said goodbye to their legacy and noted that they were going to explore different avenues. This included work started on a multiplayer shooter called Storm Divers. In January of 2020, a new blog post went up on Housemark's website. This time, it was to celebrate 25 years of the studio and also to announce that work on Storm Divers along with all other projects was being put on hold as they had partnered with a publisher to work on Housemark's most ambitious and biggest game to date. This game was Returnal. Returnal is a really interesting game for quite a few reasons. It marks a big moment for Housemark as a studio, being the release to usher them into the PlayStation Studios family. The game, being a fast action shooter with replayability as a main focus, maintains the arcade era feel of Housemark while being the studio's biggest ever release. And Returnal might possibly be one of, if not the first AAA roguelike. But you don't have to hear all this from me. Hi guys, my name is Harry Kruger and I'm the game director of Returnal. Harry and I sat down for a few minutes to talk about his work on Returnal and I would be remiss to not shout out the glass of whiskey that this man downed mid-interview, which means Harry is now responsible for two things this year that have brought me great joy. The big thing I wanted to know from Harry is how the team landed on the idea of Returnal, both as a trippy sci-fi space narrative, but also as a roguelike game. When we started concepting uh, Returnal, uh, initially, it was called Dark Planet. Basically, we, it was the result of an exercise in dreaming, you could say. You know, what, what could you make if you could do absolutely anything, you know? So a lot of our previous games, pretty much all of them in this last 12-year window, uh, they have 
let's say, been largely inspired by arcade-style experiences, right? So they're fundamentally designed for replayability. And even in our previous games, we have explored these elements of like light randomization and variation in each run to keep that that hook there, that replayability, prohibit autopilot, and keep every every session feeling fresh. We felt like roguelike was kind of the next logical step to support this formula in a way. Like, what could we do to create the ultimate replayability formula. But it was like, how can we build on our established formula and design principles and bring a bit more of that uh, richness to our variation as well? Returnal is a very fun, very addicting game. And a lot of that comes from the ways that adapts the roguelike blueprint. The reign of environment generation and permadeath bring a lot to the table in terms of difficulty and replayability, but it's the resource management, intense monster closets and exploration that brings that much more to the table. Returnal is also punishing as hell. Not only can the enemy be brutal, but the game plays delicately with risk and reward. Being deep into a run without being properly equipped is not a good idea, as you'll likely get taken out by a boss or a strong enemy if you don't have the firepower. So you'll need to explore early on in runs to have any hope of long-term success. The trade-off though is that exploration means risk-taking. It's often worth it to enter an optional room so that you can gain a possible consumable item, a better gun, resources, or anything to make you a tad bit stronger. Those optional rooms, however, can end an hour-long run if you're uncareful or unlucky lucky as what's awaiting behind that door could be a high powered enemy. It's brutal, but it's even more satisfying when you have that moment of turning a corner, not knowing what's behind a door to then discover your favorite weapon just sitting there. Returnal also has different systems that play into its risk reward ethos. Parasites, for example, are attachable creatures that you'll find in the world that grant both beneficial and detrimental effects to your suit. So you may find one that greatly increases health, but also makes it so that you suffer damage when you use keys. Ultimately, the balance of fun and difficulty in Returnal is managed by confronting the player with meaningful decision making that'll constantly make or break runs. Uh, you're expected to die and retry and retry again because that's where the roguelike formula really manifests, right? So when you die, you restart, you see that the world is different, you see that you have these uh, different describable kind of milestones in your run. It's like the roguelike formula really creates these memorable player stories in a way. Having that high, high degree of difficulty needs to be combined with uh, elements that can, that can keep each session feeling fresh and surprising, and ultimately, as you said, fun as well to keep players coming back. Creating memorable player stories is a common thread in roguelites. There's this enemy in Spelunky called the Tiki Man, and the Tiki Man starts with a boomerang. If it loses its boomerang, it's like empty handed until it steps on another boomerang and then it'll pick it up. Shops can also sell boomerangs in Spelunky. So what happened is a Tiki Man like walked into a shop, picked up the boomerang and then walked out of the shop just, you know, using its like basic AI that tells it to walk back and forth. And then the shopkeeper got mad because it technically like stole from the shop. So you, you're just designing all these things to kind of work in certain ways at, at a low level. And you, you can't necessarily see all of the possibilities that can that can come from that. Roguelites more than anything are about the systems that make them up. With permadeath and procedural generation, each time you enter a run of your game, that experience is entirely unique. This is both the cause of my own stress and joy while playing Returnal, a game that can have notoriously long runs with no way to save your game. Making it two hours into Atropos was exhilarating as I had been carving out my own journey and behind every room door, I never knew what awaited me. Yet the fact that what could be behind that door could end hours of progress meant that every choice had weight. It would take my understanding of the materials I had in hand, like ether and obelites, the type of gun I was holding, my weapon proficiency, my understanding of this biome's enemies, and more to influence what I would do next. It's an experience unlike any other. It all stems from many of those core ideas that were established in the Berlin interpretation. But the beautiful thing about roguelites is that each new game plays with that formula in different ways. It's a recipe that's been constantly adjusted with different measurements and unique ingredients added in, giving each game a different taste. But the iteration doesn't stop there. So let's talk about the future. Roguelites have been seeing a lot of rapid iteration even within the last year. 
Returnal showcased what this type of game looks like on the AAA stage, but just last year, one of the most critically acclaimed games released was Supergiant's Hades. Hades received numerous Game of the Year awards and nominations in 2020, rivaling games like The Last of Us Part II and Final Fantasy VII Remake, and it did so while being a new original title by a small indie team. It's worth talking about Hades because the game is not only a landmark for indies and more importantly roguelites, it's an example of how the design framework of a roguelite can be pushed to new heights. In Hades, you play Zagreus, aka the son of Hades. Zagreus desperately wants to escape the underworld against his father's wishes, but is faced with multiple obstacles, the shifting mazes of the underworld, and characters that repeatedly foil his progress and send him back to the beginning of his journey. This premise leads us into the roguelite setup as we control Zagreus through his attempts at freedom. This type of story setup isn't out of nature for a roguelite. Oftentimes, you'll see games put the main character in a loop scenario to justify why exactly they're going through the same motions over and over again. I have been stabbed, shot, poisoned, frozen, hung electrocuted and burned. Oh, really? It's in the care and execution where Hades separates itself, though. Where many roguelites find their narrative confined by the walls of an endless loop, Hades uses his own premise as a jumping off point to dive deep into his cast of gods and monsters. Runs in Hades take you up through the realms where you'll meet numerous characters, both allies and foes, with big personalities inspired by their Greek mythology counterparts. Megara, for example, is the first boss you'll likely meet in the game. She's one of the Fury sisters that you'll end up fighting multiple times. After defeating Megara once, she'll start appearing in the House of Hades, the hub area you'll return to after each run to reset, upgrade, and importantly, meet and talk to characters. While talking to Megara here, she might reference your previous encounters, clue you into unique details of the world and your relationship, and it's here where you can even develop that relationship to the point of romancing her. Megara is only one of many characters with dialogue to dive deep into. There's also the game's upgrade system, which ties itself to characters using boons as a framing device to allow every choice of upgrade to be a character interaction between Zagreus and the Olympian gods. Each upgrade and run is a chance to not only become more powerful during your run, but to get a bit more story along the way. Hades finds its own magnificent solutions to tying together its gameplay and its narrative. It's possibly the biggest success in this front for roguelites, but it isn't the only roguelite that's finding cool ways to tell stories. Returnal similarly went for a unique tone and feel with its own story, opting for sci-fi horror, where Selene, the main character, is trapped in a loop. Returnal's Harry Kruger called the roguelite structure something to embrace in terms of adding to the mystery of the game's narrative. I think the roguelike structure really allowed us to do something really, really interesting with that, with embracing that mystery. The more you play it, the more the game opens up, and that's true for the the narrative as well. So you'll see new audio logs being drip fed into the game, or you'll see new uh, house sequences, like the first person sequences we have in the game as well. And you're kind of feeling for Celine being trapped in this nightmarish predicament, or she's dying and being uh, reborn over and over. So that was maybe one aspect that we embraced there, just uh, a, an inseparable combination between the, the narrative and the game structure. Hades and Returnal are only a couple of examples of the cool things that can still be done with the roguelite structure. Even as I'm writing the script, I just started playing Arcade again in Early Access, a co-op roguelite shooter with wacky weapons, a fun Knockout City-like art style, and a really interesting take on injecting a PvP mid-run. And that's not all coming up. There's also Loot River, a top-down dungeon crawler with a beautiful art style, and a Tetris-style block shifting mechanic. Not to mention games like Toonchi, a beat-em-up brawler roguelite in no way related to Lil Wayne, Wizard with a Gun, an online co-op sandbox survival game with a dope art style, and Endless Dungeon, a roguelike tactical action game from Amble 2 Studios. Rogue Roguelites are not only continuing to increase in numbers, they're getting more varied and finding cool different ideas with every new title. But the rogue future goes beyond even just roguelites themselves. You know, it may get to a point where we have a hard time calling a game a roguelike or not, because I think that these concepts are really just ubiquitous in the future and not necessarily tied to this one specific genre. It's kind of like RPG, you know? You can give like any type of game some RPG elements, right? And it doesn't necessarily make it like a role-playing game. It's just a game that has, you know, experience points and some leveling and it has characters that you can talk to with dialogue trees and stuff. These are really just concepts that in the past we've associated with certain genres, but they're really just ideas that I think we like, period, that I think really connect playing video games with like real life, you know, and just make them feel more immersive and fun. So what the f is a roguelite? 
It can be a lot of things, but importantly, they're games that stick to a design framework inspired by a really old computer game that you probably haven't heard of. Why are roguelites so fun? A variety of reasons, arcade style gameplay, loads of challenge, memorable moments, and a unique way to tell stories. And are we about to see this genre become bigger than ever? Yeah, we are. Roguelites have brought a lot to gaming, and there's so much in terms of what they can still bring. The games are only getting bigger, better, and more important to video games and game design. So I'm excited to see what happens when we go from this to whatever the next big roguelike game is. But for now, I gotta get back to playing Returnal. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of The Blessing Show. This, of course, was a special event, and usually the episodes don't go this long. Usually you try to aim for about under 10 minutes long, but me and Roger want to do something really cool and really different and really special for The Blessing Show. If you liked it, I encourage you to like and share the video. This is one of the few YouTube-only products that we make here at Kinda Funny, and so any support can help and is appreciated. I'm happy to announce that The Blessing Show will return on Thursdays, the first Thursdays, of the month and so look forward to the next episode coming out on September 2nd. I'm very excited for it. I hope you're very excited for it. And again, we really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, peace out.